Hey, you guys have the Bible in your hand, on your app? Grab one in front of you. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6, and we are going to finish this book. <laughs> Woo! 13 weeks of going through Ephesians verse by verse, and I, this is not 40 verses this week, so praise Jesus, and so excited about that. This letter to the church in Ephesus has been a joy to study. It's been a joy to preach. I hope it's been a joy for you as we've walked through the very words of God that the Lord spoke through the Apostle Paul. As we've seen through this letter, the author is addressing the church in Ephesus, but he's talking about who they are and what they do, or let's make it personal, who we are in Christ and what we do if we are in Christ. The first three chapters were all about who we are. The God's people were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Hallelujah. The God's people are no longer dead in their transgressions, but made alive in Christ by grace through faith, which the Lord gives out of His abundance. That both Jew and Gentile, Jews, those who had the bloodline of the Jewish, uh, also the Gentile who didn't, that were not born into that same lineage, are offered the same salvation and God no longer sees them as different or Jew or Gentile, but He brings them together and they're given the same salvation and they're made a people, God's people. The next three chapters are all about what God's people do, that God's people are brought together in unity, and that is evidence through maturity in Christ, that you no longer have to live as you once did, referring back to the old man, as we talked about the old man that you drag with you prior to being, uh, once you're in Christ, you still want to do the things you used to do, but you don't have to because of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you are made new and you are growing, that we don't allow anything to take our allegiance other than Jesus Christ and His kingdom, that our relationships with others are a reflection of our relationship with God Himself so that there is an order, a mutual submission, and an obedience that is expected under Christ. Now, after all of that, if that is who you are in Christ, then we are headed into a battle. When many of you received Christ, or how some people describe it as accept Christ, when we started a relationship with the Lord, we had no idea we were being enlisted into a battle. Did you? Were you like, yeah, ready, let's go, I'm army. No. You were like, I don't want to go to hell. I want to, I want to feel the peace that comes from the forgiveness that God gives me for the things that I've done wrong against him. But often we've been duped to believe that we need to fight in spiritual battles that actually have nothing to do with Jesus. They have nothing to do with Satan. They actually have nothing to do with anything eternal at all. And without realizing it, when we think we are fighting this battle, we're really just swinging at our shadow. Far too often we think we're defending our faith or our God or our theology when we're really just attempting to defend our preference, our perspective, or our opinion. So turn with me, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 10 is where we get to work. And there is this powerful ending, there is this powerful admonishment to this book addressed to the Ephesians that I think not only can we learn from, but we can apply to our lives in a practical way. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Finally. You ever hear me say finally and you're like, oh good, he's almost done. Finally. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. So here's what I want you to do. If you can lift your arms, I want you to flex. Do this. Do this with me, please. Come on, you can do it. Some of you are like, yeah. I, I, relax. I said one arm, just one arm. Just, not both, just one. Some of you are like, uh, uh. Now, no, no, keep flexing. Now look around. Okay. You can't do it in your strength. You can put them down. You can't do this battle in your strength. And some of you, some of you have guns. Put those away, right? But some of you need to go do some curls. Anyway, but, but the point is, you cannot do this battle in your strength. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, we are no longer who we once were. We are made new. If we have a new identity in Jesus, we see ourselves as disciples whom Jesus 
loves. We'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. We are no longer dead in our transgressions, we're no longer dead in our sins, and we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit who comes with and provides power that is unlike anything of this world. It is through this power that we have faith to get through the day when everything is falling apart around us. You ever been there, church? It is this power that points us towards conviction when we're outside the bounds of what Scripture says we ought to do, when our attitudes and our actions are against what the Word says. It is this power, and we know this, we talk about this all the time, that raised Jesus from the dead. It is this power that makes old things new and restores and reconciles and resurrects things that were lost and dead. So Christian, be strong, not in your might, but in the Lord's might. Not in your security, but in the security that He gives you. Allow Him to do the heavy lifting. Let Him fight the war. But you, Christian, must be prepared for battle. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You know, this text preaches itself, if I'm honest. Put on the full armor of God. This is to be understood holistically. He didn't say put on parts of the armor of God. He says put on the full armor of God. This is our uniform, if you will. This is not an itemized list, even though some of us act as if it is. The full armor of God is a Christian's uniform for battle. So if you're taking notes, you ought to write that down. The full armor of God is a Christian's uniform for battle. But if you're not going into this battle, if you're afraid of it, if you're unwilling to be in this battle, you're just a poser who wears Jesus' jersey, but you don't actually play in the game. To go into battle means you need to be equipped, you need to be prepared, and like Barney says from How I Met Your Mother, you got to suit up. That's free. So Christians… If so far, as we've been going through the book of Ephesians, if this has been talking about you, if you are a sinner saved by grace and you are in Christ, the things that we do is we have to go into battle. We have to be prepared for this battle. And this battle, as we're going to see, is not against flesh and blood. It is against an enemy. And this fight is rough. And here's what you probably weren't told when you first became a Christian, that this battle will be consistent through your entire life. And the enemy knows that if he can catch you unprepared, you will quit. If he can catch you unprepared, you will quit. That's why there are so many people that say, I used to be a Christian. Because they weren't prepared. They just said, well, I believe in the heaven. I don't really like the hell, so I want to go to heaven. But they weren't prepared for the battle that the Lord brings us in. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This may or may not connect with you, but I hope it does. Sometimes what we call spiritual warfare is actually just spiritual rebellion. Sometimes we think we're fighting against the enemy. Sometimes we give the enemy all this credit when it's really just us rebelling against what God says in his word. So the one we are fighting against isn't the enemy. He's not the prince of darkness, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords of the Bible. So be careful. But you'd only know the difference if you're in God's word, submitted to his word and being changed by his word. So often we blame Satan for everything, don't we? When ultimately there's a flesh, there is a human nature that we have that tends to get us in more trouble than Satan would even pose to us. There's a story where Jesus, and we're going to read it from Mark chapter 3, so if you're in Ephesians 6, turn to Mark 3 if you want, it'll be up here as well, but there's a story about Jesus. He's been traveling from town to town. He's been preaching that the kingdom of God is now at hand. Praise Jesus, and he is here. The Lord is here And that if you would repent and trust him, you would be a resident in the kingdom of God. You would be an adopted son, an adopted daughter of the God Most High. He's been going from town to town. He's been healing people of their ailments. And then look what happens in verse 20 of Mark 3. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Jesus could draw a crowd, couldn't he? But man, could Jesus thin a crowd, couldn't he? (laughs) 
No one was able to eat. Verse 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge for, of him, for they said he is out of his mind. Could you imagine this? You're the Lord. You're King Jesus. And your siblings and other family members are going, you're crazy. And then the teachers of the law, it says in verse 22, the Pharisees, the religious guys, the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul, By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. You know what Beelzebul translates to in Greek? It's actually kind of funny. It's the Lord of the Flies. And where do the flies hover? On dung. So is the Lord of dung. That's what that translates to, just so you know. That's free, all right? Verse 23. So Jesus called them over to him and obviously was defensive. <laughs> no. But they questioned who he was from, and then Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. This text is so rich. I could write a, a year series just on this text, and so we're not going to cover everything in it, and I apologize because I love the context and I love this text, but here's a few things you need to know. Blaspheme does not mean curse. Blaspheme does not mean cuss. It doesn't mean you've used the Lord's name in vain. Blaspheme means to take upon yourself, which means that you say that you don't need the Holy Spirit because you're essentially holy, that you are the Holy Spirit or you are God. So many people that want nothing to do with the Lord want nothing to do with the Lord because ultimately at the end of the day, they think they got it. They've got it figured out. And he says, anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. You want to know the, the unforgivable sin? It's to not trust Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the unforgivable sin. You need to know that. It's not, did you do this? Did you, was, did you murder? Did you? No, no, no. The Lord can forgive you. What he cannot forgive is someone that wants to not receive the proclamation that Jesus is God. But then it says that all of this was being said. Jesus said this. Because they were saying he has an impure spirit. They were saying that not that he didn't have power, but that the power didn't come from God, it came from a demon. I was reading a friend's book yesterday, and, and in the book it was talking about why he believes what he believes. And as he was writing about it, he, he made this point. He said, no one ever questioned Jesus' character. No one in the scriptures questioned Jesus' character. He did great things. In fact, that's why the world today thinks Jesus is cool. They just don't think he's Lord. But you know what they also didn't question? They didn't question if he did miracles. We do that all the time with other people. Oh, was that miracle real? Da, 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 da. I don't think that really happened. It wasn't on Instagram. You know, that kind of thing. But no one questioned that Jesus could do miracles. They questioned where the power came from. And so there are a lot of applications to this text, but let me give you one that many of us don't realize that we're doing when we do it. To attribute to Satan what God is doing outs you and makes aware that either you're spiritually dead or spiritually immature. So when we start to see God doing stuff that we don't like and starts to pick us apart and hurts us and, and, and starts to make us really uncomfortable and we attribute it to Satan when it's really God pruning us, that actually shows us our spiritual immaturity or our spiritual deadness. So read this book. <laughs> You're pretty much going to hear two things from me every single week. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves, and read this book and apply it to your life. Apply this book. Obey this book. Trust Jesus who is this book. The devil's schemes are often shrewd, but they're often telegraphed as well. They're often kind of obvious when you start to look at things kind of from a bird's eye view. And here's the thing, I don't give Satan very much credit. I probably don't even give him as much credit as he should have. But not every difficulty we endure is because he's aiming at us. It's our sinful nature, it's our unwillingness to obey God that requires consequences. 
And it tends to put us in a lot of trouble, not because Satan's aiming at us, but because we're sinful. But when we're truly following Jesus, we're seeing fruit in us and those that we come in contact with. So in us, it's the fruit of the Spirit. When we're truly following Jesus, when we're applying the Word of God, we are growing in love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. We are growing to look more like Jesus. And when we're following Him, we're speaking words of love and encouragement and admonishment into other people, and they're falling more in love with Jesus. The enemy would and sometimes does attempt to intervene through a lot of difficult circumstances when you're doing these things. The Great Commission was not sit and make disciples. It was go. And when you're willing to go, yes, there may be situations, there may be weapons that are being thrown at you, but God gives us a marching orders, and then he gives us a list of the things that he has given to us to prepare us for battle in both offense and defense. So here we go, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Our stand for truth is more important than we realize, and so I'm going to start to preach, okay, just so you guys get ready. So in a day and age where universalism, Unitarianism, compromise, and harmony are more important than the gospel. We have made a mistake by believing that God just wants people to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And God did not do what He did by leaving the comforts of heaven and living amongst us and living the life we couldn't live and dying the death we deserve to die to make His people comfortable. Read the Scriptures. The disciples were not comfortable. That doesn't mean you have to be a martyr, necessarily. But you have to be willing to actually trust him at his word. This is one of the reasons that so much of our evangelistic techniques are not only not effective, but they're weak. Because we talk about ethereal reasons for God. We talk about, well, here's an apologetic about how he created everything, rather than the fact that sin entered the world and each and every one of us have been affected by the sin nature. And that means me, but that also means you. And that we've been affected with this virus that is killing us, and the only antidote is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us, each person that's outside these doors, every person we come in contact with are born into sin, and the only antidote is Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come to make us comfortable. He didn't, he came to bring surgery to our hearts. And when you get a, how many of you have gotten a surgery? You get cut up, don't you? And that's what God came to do. He cuts us up, and He removes the old heart, and He gives us a new one which is alive. And we must first take our stand. We must be tied to truth. We are expected to stand our ground as soldiers for Christ, so the enemy will not and cannot take ground. So if you're in Ephesians 6, you don't have to turn there. It'll be up here. But one of my favorite verses is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you've received and which you've taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So what do we take our stand on? The gospel. That Christ did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. That he lived the life that we couldn't live. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so when he says, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly, it means to be fastened to. It means to be fastened to the truth of the gospel. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Have you ever believed in something that didn't turn out to be true? I pretty much thought wrestling was real until I was 12. I'm just going to be honest about that. I actually thought WWF, that was legit stuff. And if you are not taking your stand on the truth of the gospel, what are you taking your stand on? If you are not taking your truth, or your stand on the truth of the gospel, what are you taking your stand on? So if you're taking notes, if you're in a, a, a Bible study and going through the series, this may be your last week, but here's the thing. I want you to wrestle with this. If you're not taking your stand on the gospel, what are you taking your stand on? We're often falling into the compromise We're often falling into compromising the very thing that justified us, which was Jesus was enough. 
and then we try to work our way to him, or we just sit on the sidelines. So we must guard ourselves around truth. If truth isn't what we are preaching, proclaiming, and protecting, we are on the wrong side of the battle. Think about that for a second. If the truth of the gospel is not what we're preaching, proclaiming, and protecting, we are on the wrong side of the battle. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. All right, so, so some participation up in here. How many of you are wearing belts right now? Okay, cool. Like, don't pants the other people, but I just wanted to know who was wearing belts. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. In the first century, the Roman armies, the Greek armies, the Jewish armies would go to battle in robes. How many of you have ever worn a robe? Is that a good idea to go to battle in that thing? No. But this is what they wore. And Paul uses the analogy of truth being the soldier's belt because we must be fastened up. Otherwise, if you're wearing that robe and you run into battle, what's happening to that robe? It's falling right off and you're going to be naked. And that would be a really weird way to go to battle, but so would be wearing a robe, just thinking about out loud. And so this idea of the analogy of truth being the soldier's belt is what we're fastened up with. Otherwise, we will easily trip over ourselves, our own thinking, and our own human wisdom. You and I as Christians can only move. We can only take ground. We can only fight truth with God or we can only fight by using God's truth. Now, I know many will this truth without understanding at all what it actually is. That happens a lot, how it ought to be communicated, but it is truth that we stand firm in, it is truth that we are bound by, and it's what makes Christians connected. Because some of the other cults and faiths can say that Jesus is Savior, but which Jesus Is it the one that claims that he is the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except through him? Or is it Satan's brother that some cults teach? Was it Jesus who was the second coming of the archangel Michael? Was it the truth of Jesus from Scripture or the Jesus that someone has made up in their own mind where he can just be neutered? Here's the thing. When I study and write these messages every week, I personally have accountability. When I'm teaching the text, if I'm going to share it with you, I want to make sure that what I'm saying is not just my opinion. Not only do I read commentaries, not only do I listen to sermons that are of people that I appreciate and respect, but I have most pastor, pastors in this area are friends of mine, and so I'll send them a text, I'll send them an email, I'll go to their office, and I'll go, hey, I'm wrestling with this because I'm not sure it's orthodox. I'm not sure it's the truth that everyone would agree upon over the past 2,000 years. And here's the thing. Nothing is new under the sun. So if someone comes to you with, I have new revelation, run. They're leading a cult. There is nothing new under the sun. Because here's the reason I have the accountability when I teach. And I hope you understand this. And I would guess that most of us don't. Nothing is more detrimental to your soul than false teaching. Nothing is more detrimental to your soul than false teaching. If you write down one note, write that down. Nothing is more detrimental to your soul. Do you want me to spell detrimental? I'm just kidding. Nothing is more detrimental to your soul than false teaching. Because there are many people that think they get it. There are many people that think they did what they ought to do to become a Christian, and yet you talk to them, and you go, something's off, because they trusted false teaching. Guys, I don't want to be a pastor. That's not what I want to do with my life. I'm not going, yay, pastoring. You know why I'm a pastor? Because the Lord said so. That's it. I'm just being obedient, and He's chosen to grow me through this situation. But the thing that keeps me up at night is the fear that I would teach falsely because nothing is more detrimental to your soul than false teaching. So that's why I have to give you three things that I cannot and will not compromise. And if you don't like it, go somewhere else. You ready? I will not compromise proclaiming the true gospel. I can't. I have to constantly point us to the fact that it's not about you. It's about Jesus. 
Secondly, I cannot compromise, sub- I, I cannot compromise the fact that we are going to constantly submit to the very words of God. We must submit to this. Guess what? When culture tells us something else, we don't trust culture. We trust God. So I cannot compromise that. And then lastly, and this is something that not everyone likes because people like their prayer when they were a kid to be enough, even though nothing's changed in their lives. I cannot compromise focusing on spiritual maturity as evidence of justification. Here's what I mean. Alive things grow. And if you're not growing, I hate to tell you this, you're dead. You're spiritually dead. That's not popular. That's not the way to get these seats full. But I cannot compromise this and have a clear conscience before my Lord when I leave this place. Focusing on spiritual maturity as evidence of justification. All right, verse 14. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Okay, let's, let's make sure we understand righteousness. Righteousness means that you are right before God. Guess who did that? God, not you. You might have received it, but God was the one who gave you your righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The breastplate in a Roman soldier's armor was the heavy section that fitted over his torso. Its chief purpose was to protect the vital organs of the body from being pierced by an arrow or a sword or any other weapons. And Paul says that Christians need to protect these vital areas with righteousness, like your heart. Remember the classic story of the great hero Achilles? You guys remember Achilles? Anyone? Okay. It's a good story. Achilles seemed invincible, and the legend has it that his mother, when he was a baby, dipped him into some kind of magical potion or Lazarus pit or I don't know, and coated his entire body with invincible, with this invincible magic potion and an invincible shield. But when she dipped him into the substance, she had to hold him by the tip of his heel so that one portion of his body was not covered with this magic solution. It was here that in the course of great battle in the Trojan War, Achilles was struck in the hill by an arrow and was killed. He had one uncovered point on his body where he was vulnerable, and when believers are living in unconfessed sin, they are vulnerable to the assaults of Satan. This is not popular, but this is true. It is not popular to think that, unfortunately, when we have some place where we're vulnerable, guess where Satan's going to stick his finger? Guess where Satan's going to try to attack us? And it is this righteousness that protects us from the evil one. As he throws attacks, he will aim at your character, won't you? Won't he? He will aim at our character. He will attempt to break us down. And if you are not shielded by the righteousness that only comes from what Christ has done for you, that he's given to you, you will fail. And you will probably give up. It is the fact that he has created a character in us, Christ has, that is consistent with our calling to be a follower of Jesus. And we are imputed that righteousness so we can act like who he is. Verse 15, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So in war, and especially in this context, there were foot soldiers. There weren't tanks. There weren't, you know, Iron Man things. There was, there was literally foot soldiers that would walk, and they would carry their shields and their spears. <clears throat> and mobilization of these foot soldiers is what won or lost the war. That's what this looked like. And this was the tactical approach that this generation had in its battles. So how your feet were covered, I'm not talking Nikes, but how your feet were covered and fitted made a huge difference in war. In fact, when information needed to be given from one city to another city, they couldn't text it. So what did they do? Carrier pigeon? Not yet. What did they do? They sent messengers, didn't they? And not someone that was like, oh, I have a really important thing from the king. Okay, I guess I'll just stroll into the next city. Those messengers ran like the Flash, but not really that fast. Superman's faster anyway. But it's true. But these messengers would run from city to city. And so in the ancient world, it was customary in some places that if the messenger brought bad news, he was punished. 
Not because he did the bad thing, but he was bringing the bad news, hence killing the messenger is a term that we use today. If it was bad news, then he was burdened by the news that he was carrying, carrying, and he was fearful of what treatment he might expect. As each city posted lookouts to watch for the approaching runners, it became almost a science whereby, through the lookout, they could determine whether the messenger was bringing good news or bad news. How would they be able to tell? Simply by seeing how the person was running. Because if there was victory, if there was something exciting, if it was good news, his feet would be flying, wouldn't they? He would be kicking up lots of dust. There would be an exuberance and enthusiasm in his stride as he approached the walls of the city. Hence the phrase, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Don't we have some good news to bring? In fact, Paul talks about this in Romans 10. He quotes this, verse 14 through 15. How then can they call in the one whom they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Your feet are beautiful, Christians, if you would trust the Lord and bring this message. Verse 16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Another question I want you to think about, especially in small group if you're in one, how do you respond to the attacks of the enemy? How do you respond to the attacks of the enemy? He is an accuser. He is a liar. He's attempting to distract, discourage, and defeat those who are are already on the winning team but that doesn't mean he won't try. So how do you respond to the attacks of the enemy? Do you cower in the corner? Do you run for the hills? Or do you, as James reminds us in his book in the first chapter, in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, some that are brought on by you and some that are the evil one, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Trials are what the Lord allows us to go through to make us more complete, to make us more mature, to make us more like Christ. So take up this shield. Be confident in the gospel, not in yourself. Not in your wisdom, not in your works, but in Jesus Christ, the Lord's work, because he did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. So do you have faith in Jesus? Or do you have faith in your church? Do you have faith in your willingness or ability to do things? Or do you have faith in Jesus? Because this is your shield. It is the faith in the Lord that is your shield that will go up against the Roman army if they were to come at you, if they were shooting arrows at you. It is the shield that would stop them. Because our faith is not in a puny God. Our faith is in a mighty God who is the Alpha and the Omega. So our struggle is not how much faith we have, but who our faith is actually in. And my faith is in a big, big God. Verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So first the helmet. The helmet protected the head, where it was so easy to deliver a fatal blow, isn't it? For those of you that have fought in a war, Although Satan cannot kill the soul, he can wound the mind. That was a big takeaway, first service. Even though Satan cannot kill the soul, he can wound the mind. So those who have salvation have their minds covered by the salvation, past, present, and future, that has been given to us by Christ. So if you are questioning your faith, if you are questioning your salvation, if you are questioning your security in Christ Jesus, hear me, if you've trusted in the true God, you're secure. Ooh, not because of how good you are, but because of how good he is. So if you're a committed follower of Jesus, if you are committed not because of a prayer you once prayed or a baptism you once did, but because of a growing devotion in the king named Jesus, you live already forgiven. There's something so freeing about that. Here's the thing. Being in battle is not, not just about defense. But thank God it's about offense as well. 
It is about using the tools in which the Lord has provided us. So not only do we have the helmet of salvation, and remember, this is holistically, this is the full armor of God. This isn't just, oh, I have a helmet on salvation, and I run around with that, but nothing else. Then you're just a dude running around with a helmet. That's weird. But this is holistic, and he says that we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the truth, which is the Word of God. Nothing is more powerful than the truth. Nothing. Think about that. Quiz yourself. Okay, was the truth? Okay, I didn't tell them the truth in this scenario because I was afraid, but what would have been more powerful? The truth. Every single time. Nothing is more refining, nothing is more defining than the truth being presented. Nothing is more defining and refining than the truth washing over you and I of the Word of God and our response of obedience to the Word of God. As the year comes to a close, as this series comes to a close, as this passage comes to a close, I want to point us again, I've already said it, what I will not compromise on, but I want us to constantly be reminded that we are about proclaiming the true gospel. We are about submission to the very words of God. And that doesn't mean you have to come in here perfectly, because if that were true, I'd be the first to leave. But you have to be willing to go, all right, Lord, I don't like what you said about identity here, but I trust you. I don't like what you said about marriage here, but I trust you. I don't like what you said about me not wanting or... I don't like what you say about pleasure. I don't like what you say about enter whatever sin you have in your own life here and say, but Lord, I'm willing to trust you. Not perfectly, but pursuing. So we're about proclaiming the true gospel, submission to the very words of God, and focusing on spiritual maturity as evidence of justification. Here's the thing. My kids, the older two, they both believe in their minds. And they would happily be baptized if I told them they should. But until there is evidence that they're willing to trust the Lord with their lives, not just in mouth, but in lives, with their actions, with their lives, I'm not going to just assume they're good. And I think we have this hopefulness. And I understand. I think hope is given to us by God. But I also think we've heard false teaching that says all you have to do is pray a prayer. And I'm not satisfied with just being justified. I want to be sanctified. I want to grow more into the likeness of Jesus. Whoever you talk to would never go, no, I don't want to grow in peace, patience, love, uh, self-control. No, none of that sounds good. No, all of us want that. But here's the thing. We have to be in submission to God to actually receive it. And that's not something we want. That's not something most people want. Verse 18, and pray in the Spirit. I'd like to point out the fact it's capital S, Holy Spirit. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So are you praying for God's people? For God's people that maybe worship differently than you do? For people that may take a different stance on predestination than you do? Are you praying for the Lord's people in other countries that can't even have a bound book of the Bible? Are you praying for the Lord's people because we have the opportunity and we are gifted with the Spirit who actually intercedes on our behalf for us? Are we consistently looking towards, I need to take this time to pray for those that are the Lord's people because they need encouragement? And then Paul, the most bold guy, in my opinion, in Scripture outside of Jesus, Paul, the most bold guy, then says this in verse 19, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul's the most bold dude I've ever heard of, and he's asking you to pray for his boldness. The dude gets gets shipwrecked after preaching the gospel, being thrown out of town, going back into town, getting a rock thrown on his head, goes back into town to preach the gospel, gets on a boat, gets shipwrecked, gets off the ship, gets onto an island, gets bit by a snake, and he continues to preach the gospel. Come on! He prayed for boldness. How much more should we? that he will make known the mystery of the gospel, verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Remember, he was chained to a guard. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. So let me take you to the great theologian, M.C. Hammer. He said, we need to pray just to make it today. Hey, hey. (laughs) 
Those are some good words from my childhood. Way before I knew Jesus, I knew I needed to pray just to make it today. And I cannot stress how important it is to have an ongoing dialogue with the Lord, not where you treat Him as Santa, but where you hear from Him as well through His Word. You may not have known once you were committed to Jesus that you would be enlisted into battle for the King of Kings against the Prince of Darkness, but God not only prepares you, He gives you the full armor of God holistically, not itemized, so that we would be people that would actually take the truth with us, that we would actually have the truth fastened around us, that we would have the breastplate of righteousness, that we would have the helmet of salvation, that we would walk in the surety that we are made right because of Christ, but we're in a battle. And if you're not prepared, you will give up. You won't lose your salvation, but you'll give up growing because growth doesn't happen accidentally. Growth happens by the Holy Spirit and your will and cooperation to obey the very words of God. Verse 21 and 22, T-Bone, I don't know how to say his name, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship team, come on up as I read this last verse. Verse 24. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. These are the last words in the book of Ephesians. These are the last words that Paul pens as he sends this letter on to Ticketius. Ticketus. Ticka, 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 ticka. Um, as he sends this letter, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with, the, with an undying love. So here's my question for you. Those of you who have, maybe this is your first sermon or maybe this is your 13th, do you love the Jesus Christ of the Bible with an undying love? Because nothing's more important than that. Nothing's more important than trusting the Lord at His word and loving the true God versus one that you've made up in your own mind. <clears throat> Starting next week, we'll begin a series leading up to Christmas that's going to make very crystal clear what we as Christians are expected to do and the gifts that we receive from trusting the Son who has come bearing gifts. Some will not be here in the new year. Some will hear of this challenge that Jesus actually makes you a new creation. That means you're not who you once were. Some will hear the, the challenge of the fact that when you become a Christian, you get a new identity and you can't make Christianity about you anymore. Some of you may not like the fact that Jesus didn't just save you. He saved you to a people. But this is the Lord of the Bible. And this is what he's done. And this is what he's offered to us. And I refuse to teach things that would be detrimental to your soul. And so I got to teach the truth. And it's going to hurt a little. And by a little, I mean a lot. And it's going to challenge us. And, but here's what I can promise you. As James said, it is these trials that produce perseverance in us that lead us towards maturity. And so I would encourage you, even as I said at the beginning of the service, December's the month where we can invite people. And it's not weird. And I'd encourage you to invite your friends and family, those who you just want to understand more of who Jesus is. I promise you I'll preach them every week. And we will not compromise on these things.